minute. Okay. All right. The recording has started. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the class. Uh, I'm seeing some some people having some problems connecting to the class, um, but we're going to pray. Let's pray, and we will get started. Um, others are coming in. Hmm. I don't know why people are finding it difficult to connect. Okay. Thomas is connected. <clears throat> And hopefully Aaron will connect as well. And, uh, okay, let's pray. We will start. All right, um, Thomas, would you like to pray so we can start? Is it possible for you to pray, Thomas? Or Uh, can't hear Thomas. Uh, Thomas, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but your mic doesn't seem to be on mute. For some reason we can't hear you. Um, okay. All right. Uh, Dave, why, uh, why don't you please pray and we'll start. Sure. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. Again, Lord Jesus, thank you that we've gone through our classes, uh, but we are going to do another classes now, Lord God. I pray that you be with us and you anoint each one of us. We pray that your spirit to be with us, Lord Jesus, to open up our heart and let your word in our heart, Lord Jesus, so that we can uh, be uh, so that we can apply it in our life, Lord Jesus. So then, not just by learning, Lord Jesus, but let every knowledge that we have, let us uh, be thankful to you and let us be able to apply it in our life, Lord God. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, once again. And um, thank you for connecting uh, to this class today. We are... Uh, continuing our journey here, just sharing practical things on urban church planting and uh, things that you and I keep in mind as we either plant a church or start some sort of a ministry in an urban context, right? So we just want to communicate uh, practical things that we could use uh, uh, when we go about doing this. So let me just share the PDF that we are reviewing uh, we are in the second section of this uh, course where we are looking at uh, the practical side of uh, urban church planting. So yesterday we, we talked a little bit about knowing your target audience and uh, you know how they are connecting and so on. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, that, uh, and, and this is just a side note, um, and one of the things that uh, as a pastor and as a church ministry, we, we usually have this discussion is, uh, you know, when we when we do our services, our Sunday morning services, uh, you know, many times we do sermon series, you know, a series of messages to cover a certain theme or topic. It could be a study of a book in the Bible. It could be a study on a certain topic. And so that whole study is divided into several series. So the big question, I think many pastors and uh, we also here at uh, APC try to uh, try to understand is how long should a sermon series be? You know, um, is having a long sermon series good or bad? You know, if what if you do five sermons in a series? What if you do eight sermons in a series? That is two months. Now, what if you do 12, which is three months? Is that too long to be on a particular topic? And the fact is certain certain series will take that long. For example, if you're studying First Corinthians, you know, there are uh, 16 chapters there. So it's going to take you at least 16 weeks or so, you know, to cover that book and so on. Uh, so, 
uh, there's just a side note. So what do we do? We try to get a feel of how the congregation, you know, uh, every congregation is different, uh, just depending on, uh, you know, where the congregation is. Uh, so I'm, you're not going to get a universal answer, but at least for your own congregation, you know, you, you need to ask them, are you okay? Are you comfortable? And so, you know, right now we are doing a poll through our YouTube channel just to get a feel of, you know, how are people? And right now we are transitioning from online services to in-person services. At the same time, we're doing a sermon series. So we're doing a poll uh, just to get a feel of, you know, what what is our our the people that we're serving? How are they going through all of this? You know, so I'm just putting that example out, saying that you know, um, not only in your starting phase, but also down the road, you know, as you are doing your ministry, it's good to get a feel of, uh, you know, the congregation, the people you are serving. Uh, how are they? engaging with the ministry how are they relating to what you are giving to them you know it's good to ask them let them express uh, um, and of course you can do this through online surveys and things like that okay that was just a side note um, so what we said was you know uh, as you're preparing to launch get to understand your target audience uh, and there's nothing wrong in saying look these are the people I'm going to serve. They are my primary target. They're my focus area. Um, and uh, you are, of course, open to everybody, but this is my focus area. Right? Uh, and then as you go about doing that, identify people whom God has already prepared. And I shared with you yesterday, uh, towards the close, uh, towards the end, how uh, when we started All People's Church in 2001 here in Bangalore, uh, in a very first service, a very old friend of mine, a school friend of mine walked in. And of course, you know, by that time we were all married. And he he was married. He had a child. We were married. I was married. And, you know, we had two kids. So it, it was a time pass. But the moment he walked in, it was like a great connect. And he was so much part of uh, the start of the church and, and uh, for several years until, you know, they, they, as a family moved overseas. But... Uh, uh, for him to walk into that very first service was such an encouragement to us, uh, uh, you know. And uh, so, you know, I, I could only say God orchestrated that, uh, and it was a very important thing. So, I like that God orchestrates, you know, these connections, people He brings into your life, uh, and you need just to be open, especially as you uh, go about getting ready to launch. So we talked about identifying your launch location. Where are you going to start? And you choose them. You know, you look at some practical things about um, your launch location. Okay? So we're going to move forward from there. A couple of other things as you're preparing to launch and you identify your launch location is also identify other locations around where you are starting your ministry. Right? Maybe at the church hall or uh, the, the office the place where you're starting your ministry, you need to know, hey, uh, there are places where we can evangelize. We can go and you know, reach out with these campuses, malls, uh, wherever, you, you know, depending on your city, whatever is permitted. Uh, where are the places you can meet people to disciple them? You know, uh, there may be coffee shops and you can say, hey, I, I can meet with you there during the week to disciple, uh, to, to minister to you maybe restaurants or maybe believers' homes, so on. Or sometimes uh, there are people who come with special needs, you know, uh, for counseling, for finding jobs, for uh, de addiction programs, so on. So you need to know that there are these options available for them so that you can guide people if they come, guide them to those things. So be aware of uh, all of these uh, these kinds of things so that, when people reach out for help, you will be able to meet with them in places that are convenient to them uh, and also guide them to places where they can receive help. Now, just a side note is, in this course, we are focusing on a church plant, you know, how you're getting a church started. Now, some people may wish to take a house church model. That means, uh, they are not interested in, you know, moving into an auditorium and having a big congregation 
and uh, you know doing all those kinds of things they may just choose to have small groups of people meeting in different homes so we call that a house church model and uh, uh, you know uh, in some scenarios uh, that may be uh, the best option uh, i remember for instance um, when there was a lot of persecution happening uh, this was uh, uh, I think it was somewhere in 2000. Um, I might get the years wrong, but I think it must have been around 2008, 9, um, especially in Orissa, you know, uh, the state of Orissa, uh, one of our states here. Uh, there was a lot of persecution happening. It was very bad. Uh, and uh, we had a church plant in uh, one of the smaller towns and uh, churches were being attacked. And in fact, our pastor there, uh, uh, you know, people had actually come and caught him. And, and we, you know, when, when this started happening, he spoke to us and we said, yeah, close down. We, we were renting a hall. We had equipment. We had all that set up there. Um, we said, okay, yeah, go ahead, close it down, move the equipment over, over to your house and all of that, because people are targeting, you know, these, wherever churches were meeting. And uh, so he was doing that. In fact, in one of those occasions, uh, these people actually caught him, you know, and somehow he just, is, you know, he literally, he wiggled his way out and he, you know, he escaped so that they couldn't harm him. Uh, but it was those kind of very severe persecution. And uh, so I think for a whole year or for two years, and again, again I may not remember the duration correctly, uh, but uh, there was no, you know, meeting as a congregation. So uh, there were about 60 people uh, and they were only meeting in small, small groups, very quietly in people's homes. And that's how the church went for about two year period. And until when everything subsided, you know, they got back to um, uh, congregational mode. So uh, in some situations, uh, a house church model is... Uh, a good option uh, and so if that's the way you want to go that's fine you so you just have you know churches happening gatherings happening small gatherings happening in different homes so it's not very um, visible outside people don't see you know uh, large numbers of people going into a place it's just few people meeting in different homes you know that way but what we are really focused on is uh, you know a planting a church that will grow into a large congregation and then go forward from there, okay? So we move to the next uh, part of um, the practical side, which is the launch phase. So, you know, you've done all your survey, you've identified where you're going to start, you've identified your location, uh, you've got your place to start, which may be a hall, it could be a home, uh, whatever it is, you know, so you're, you're ready to start. What are some things to keep in mind once you're launching the Sunday services or the ministry you're going to open up? You know, there are many different ways you can do uh, a launch. Uh, you could do a simple, quiet launch that means you just get your services started. There's no fanfare, there's nothing big happening. Or uh, you could have a very special launch event where you, you know, invite people from all the neighborhood and you have something special like a music concert or a gospel meeting or a healing service. It's very highly visible to the uh, community around, you know, either way, whatever you feel is conducive. It all depends on the, the place where you are starting. Uh, and you may want to launch in a very big way or you may do a very quiet launch either way. You know, you, you can determine. Uh, or you have a series of special meetings where you invite people from the neighborhood to come, you attend. Uh, you can have a, a series of uh, seminar or messages on a certain topic, um, invite people to come. So there are different ways to launch. But some simple things to keep in mind when you are launching is, you know, keep things simple uh, so that new people will find it easy to follow. So don't get, don't make your service or um, the ministry very complicated. You know, when people come, they should just understand, okay, there's a time for singing, there's a welcome address, and then there's the message, and then people pray and are dismissed. So keep it very simple. Um, 
uh, set your expectations. You know, so um, usually the first service or the first few services uh, is what this you know set uh, is what people understand, and then that's their expectation thereafter, right? So you let people know, hey, this is what our service is going to be like. And so on. Even if you're doing a special meeting, like a big concert, you can, you know, slowly tell people, "Hey, this is a very special event, but our regular services will be like this. We will have 30 minutes of worship or 40 minutes of worship. We will have uh, a time for the word and prayer and so on. You know, you let people know what to expect when they come uh, to your services. Share your vision. Why are you starting the church? Why are you starting?" The ministry, whatever you're doing, right? So when people come in the beginning, you have launched. Uh, that's a good time to envision people, so that people understand why you're doing what you're doing, and if they feel in their heart they want to connect, they will do it, right? And uh, communicate the vision that God has put in your heart. I remember when we started uh, All People's Church, and you know, like the very beginning, we were in in the living room. It wasn't a very big space. We just had about twelve people. In the very first service, and for many of the you know the services in the early phase, we kept repeating. You know, our vision uh, is to be salt and light in the city of Bangalore, a voice to the nation and to the nations. So from the very beginning, that was the vision, and uh, it hasn't changed. So people were thinking, you know, okay, we are going to influence our city. We're going to influence our nation. And we're going, also going to influence nations. And at that time, we were just 12 people sitting in a living room. But the vision was there that one day we would become a people who would impact nations. Right? So we, we started sharing that vision from day one, from our very opening service. This is our vision to be salt and light in the city of Bangalore, a voice to the nation of India and to the nations. So that was the vision. And so people, are okay. Yeah. Now there are testimonies people have, uh, you know, shared with us that uh, when they saw this, I mean, um, and those days we also used to have a map that used to be projected on the screen. So they'll see the map of India. They will see the nations, you know, on the screen. And uh, people have shared, you know, that that vision was something very captivating. It caught their attention. They said, I want to be a part of it, you know, and that, encouraged them or that uh, was a major uh, decider for them to be part of the church. So sharing a clear vision, sharing why you are there, what you want to do uh, is going to really, uh, you know, uh, help people decide whether they want to be part of what you're doing. And one very important thing from the, from the beginning, when you start the church or the ministry, Keep everything focused on Jesus. You know, let people know it's not about you. It's not about your gifting or your personality or anything. It's not about a person, a human. It's about Jesus. So, you know, focus everything on Jesus. And keep maintain that throughout, okay? From the very beginning, from your very first church service or from the time you start the ministry, do it like that. Some other thoughts to keep in mind when you are doing your first service and sometimes people forget is you know plan for follow-up right so you have invited people and uh, you know you don't know who's going to come so there'll be new people who come uh, they will you know they may just come out of curiosity they may come because hey something new is happening in the neighborhood or whatever for various reasons people are coming now your goal is not to just get them to come for the first, for the launch service. Uh, your goal is to see if, you know, you could have an ongoing relationship with them and they can keep coming back and become part of the church, a part of the ministry. Now, for that to happen, you need to know their name. You need to get their contact details so that you could follow up with them, right? So uh, you need to have a very simple, uh, non-threatening way to uh, establish connect with the people who come and uh, to be able to follow up with them, right? Now, you don't want to become a nuisance to them. You don't want to trouble them, uh, but uh, in a very simple way that uh, you get their contact details so you can follow up. So uh, 
to even just their phone number. You know, so as part of the very first service, keep it in mind. You know, people are going to come, but how can I follow up with them? Right. So what we used to do is uh, we used to have like a welcome packet. So in that packet, there would be uh, maybe a New Testament, uh, uh, you know, a book, something that we can give to them that they will want to take back with them. And of course, there's a little information about the church. And we also give them a little contact piece of a card where they can put in their name and at least their mobile number. And if they want to, they can enter their email ID. So in a very gentle way, we say, hey, you know, welcome. Here, here's our welcome packet. It's our gift to you. Uh, so put something in that they will want to take back with them. Uh, but here's a little contact card if, you know, we'd like to be in touch with you. So if you don't mind, can you give us your name and number or name and email ID, whatever you prefer. So that is very important, you know. So now it is true that not everybody will fill it up and you can't force people to fill it up. You're only making a request and you're explaining why. You're saying it's, we are going to, it'll help us be in touch with you. Right, so uh, you give it out to them, and you know, usually, you know, people will fill it up and give it back. Some may not, and that's okay. Right? Some people just come to see things for the first time, and if they're interested, they may come back on their own, and the second time they may uh, fill up the card. Uh, but uh, you're giving it to them, and uh, then you then you have a way to receive it back. You can say, you know, some, you know, uh, we will come and collect it from you, or you can drop it in that box on your way out. You know, some some way for by which you can, uh, you know, collect that back. But this is very important. And you train people. And if you have your core team and a few volunteers by this time, you train them and say, hey, you know, this is how you go and you collect the contact information, establish a rapport, make friends, and uh, you know, that's how in a very in a very loving way, in a very gentle way, you collect their information. And of course, then you can uh, put it into a, you know, you store their contact information in a, in some sort of a contact list. Um, uh, I will show you, we will show you in another course when we talk about media and technology, and when we talk about software systems, we'll show you, you know, there are church management systems that you could use where you can store church, you know, this kind of data, or you can just use a simple Excel sheet uh, where you put their name, number, email, or address, whatever, and store it, right? But don't lose that information because that's important. That's, you know, when, when you need to follow up with them. So once you get their contact information, make sure you call them within one or two days. And uh, it's just a welcome call. You know, you, you just say, hey, thank you for coming. We are so happy. Uh, that uh, you, did you enjoy the service? Do you have any thoughts? Do you have any feedback? Uh, other things we can pray for you about? And, uh, you know, we'd love to have you back with us next Sunday or, you know, if there's something happen happening in the middle of the week, you can call, invite them for that or you can invite them to the next Sunday service and so on. You know, uh, or if you're doing a house group meeting, you can invite them to that house group meeting. But the important thing is this. Yeah, you know, you are investing so much into the launch, into that opening service. Don't lose out on the people who come, right? Welcome them. Now, of course, there may be people who come from other churches. And one of the things we have been doing from the very beginning is we always announce, we tell people, if, you're, if you belong to another church where God's word is being preached, remain faithful there. But if you're looking for a home church, then come back, worship with us, and see if this is where God wants you to be planted. So it's kind of a standard announcement we make where we're telling people, look, if you already are part of a church, we don't want you to leave that church and come here. Right? You'll be faithful there. But if they are searching for a home church, maybe they're new to the city or maybe they haven't really settled down in a particular church, they're still searching, looking, then you give them the option to see if uh, you know, this this new church that you are starting, this new service that you've introduced is something that they would want to consider, right? So that should also come through very clearly, okay? So uh, keep this in mind. The follow-up part to the launch is very important. 
and thereafter you continue to do this every service so even today right uh, 20 years later we still do the same thing right when we have um, a service we welcome anybody who's there for the first time and uh, we do this you know we give them a welcome packet we uh, request them to if they want to fill up a card so we can follow up with them now uh, during the pandemic the last two years things have or uh, last uh, almost little over a year and a half now things have changed because we're not having in-person services so what we did we just moved this uh, first time this is a card to online so we just tell people if you're with us for the first time you can go online and fill up the card and we still have on a weekly basis you know maybe uh, two or three sometimes more sometimes less uh, you know people will fill up this thing then they let us know hey uh, this is my first time I'm looking for a church and so immediately on when we get that information on Sunday by Monday somebody will call them connect with them answer questions so we still do the same thing even though we are in an online mode because that follow-up is important you know, you're, you're, you're there to serve people they are looking they have questions uh, they may need assistance so you're just providing it in a loving way in a gentle way okay so let me pause here uh, uh, is uh, any uh, everything okay um, any questions so we just talked about the launch we went through pre-launch this is the launch this is how you launch your service here are some practical things you can do um, or when you start your ministry here are some practical things we, you can do any questions so far uh, any thoughts, any comments? Everything okay? All right. Okay. All right. Any questions? Thomas, do you have a question? Or I see your comments in the chat. Right. Okay. Fine. So let's uh, move forward now. We're going into uh, uh, another uh, chapter or in this whole discussion where we're going to talk about strategies for urban evangelism or urban missions. So you are planting a church. You've done all the preliminary work. And then you've come to this launch. That means you officially made yourself known to your community, the area where you're doing the ministry as a church. Or you could, uh, you know, it may be a ministry, it may not necessarily be a church. It may be, you know, you're starting a youth ministry, a music ministry, a coffee shop, whatever ministry. You know, so you've officially launched, you've opened, you've started the work. Now, the next thing, of course, is to reach out to the people in the city or in the community. So we call that evangelism or missions. You're reaching out to people uh, in that urban setting. You know? So how do you, what can you go, how do you go about doing that? What are some of the opportunities you should look for? And uh, so I just, you know, we just want to share with you things that we have done here in Bangalore uh and um, things that have worked for us and of course you know we have to keep improving or keep adapting as time goes by because uh, uh, the city itself is changing how things are happening around us is changing so we constantly keep adapting uh, the methods the the ways you can reach out to people right so just sharing some thoughts here that uh, you could use uh in in your part of the you know whichever city you are involved in now the first important thing is uh, to keep methods that are wholesome right that means uh, they should be spirit-led they should be legal they should be ethical don't you know in in, in talking about reaching people in the city uh, don't get into something that's uh, um, you know dishonorable definitely not nothing that's illegal, definitely nothing that's unethical, right? For example, you know, and this is something people accuse the Christian church of, uh, I think many, 
many times uh, incorrectly is, oh, they are giving out money so that uh, giving out cash uh, so that people can come to their church or so that people can come uh, and become Christians. You know, uh, uh, to my knowledge, I've never known any church or Christian ministry doing that. But these kind of accusations come, you know, uh, uh, definitely we don't engage in such things, right? So th that is unethical. It's illegal. You know, we're not trying to convert people by money or uh, coercing them into these kinds of things, right? So we don't engage in such kind of methods. Uh, we don't engage in, you know, uh, uh, making false promises uh, and trying to seduce people to join the church and things like that. So our methods must be led by the Holy Spirit. They are legal and they are ethical, right? They are clean. So that's very important. And also, uh, we must be relevant. Culturally sensitive, be culturally relevant. So depending on the kind of people uh, the community you're working with, uh, you know, be sensitive to the local culture, the culture of the community. Be sensitive uh, to, you know, how things are done there. So be relevant, be sensitive. Right? Don't offend people or don't offend, uh, you know, uh, their culture uh, while we going about presenting the gospel to them. And our goal is not to hurt people. Our goal is to present the message of Jesus and see if they are interested uh, in knowing more and wanting to be saved and receiving the gospel. So we just uh, must be careful in how we do this, right? So, um, you know, uh, this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 23, is, is, is a wonderful guideline to for us in doing uh, ministry, especially in the context we're talking about in urban missions. Let's take a moment to just read that. First Corinthians chapter 9. Um, could somebody please read this passage for us? Verses 16 through 23. First Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. Somebody could read it for us, please. First Corinthians chapter 9, 16 to 23. For uh, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessary is lead upon me, yes, vow is me, if I do not praise the gospel, for for if I do this will willingly, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have been enthralled with a stewardship, what is my reward then, that when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel, gospel of christ with our charge that mm -hmm. i may not abuse my authority in the gospel for for through i am free from all men i have made myself a servant to all that i might win the more and to the jews i be, be became as a jewish that i might win jewish to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without law as without law, not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, I that I might win the weak. I have become all things, to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake. I I may be partaker of it with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Paul is talking about his motivation in proclaiming the gospel and sharing the gospel. And in fact, he's so motivated, he says, woe is me, verse 16, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. He says, I'm compelled to preach the gospel. And it's a stewardship, it's a, uh, it's a binding, it's a responsibility that, you know, it's an, a, a trust that God has placed in me. That's verse 17. And so he says, you know, how does he go about, of course, he says, you know, I do not abuse my authority in the gospel. I don't misuse the gospel and 
uh, what God has entrusted me with. But what do I do? Verse 19, he says, I make myself a servant to all. So I go in to serve the people. I make myself, verse 19, I've made myself a servant to all. So here's a simple key, right? When, uh, when we are thinking about strategies, methods, our goal is how can we serve people? And like we said earlier, uh, the reason we want to understand our target audience is because we want to know their needs so that we can serve them, serve those needs, address those needs. So how can we serve people? Verse 19. So that by serving them, he says, I can win them. I made myself a servant to all that I might win the, win the more, win more people. So you serve, you address a need, and in that process, you're able to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, uh, he says, you know, in this process of serving people, verse 20, he says, I am becoming like the people I'm serving in the sense to the Jews, I become like the Jew. Those who are under the law, I become as one under the law. Those who are without the law, I become as one without the law, but yet I remain under law to Christ. To the weak, I become weak. I've become all things, verse 22, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. So the point here is that I step into people's worlds. Right? I relate to them uh, in a way that they can understand, in a way that they can, you know, connect. And I relate to them. And the reason I'm doing this is so that I can, I would be able to, you know, share the gospel and lead them to faith in Christ. So Paul is sharing for the gospel. I serve people. I become relevant. I relate to them. I step into their world so that I could, you know, then reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that's what we need to think about as we are thinking of strategies, methods, ways in which we are going to serve people, right? We are going to step into their worlds. What are things that they are facing? What are things that they are going through? Uh, how can we help them, right? So for example, you say, okay, I wanna reach um, college going students. Okay, that's good, that, that's your target audience. But we need to step into their world. What are they going through? What are their areas of struggles? What are their challenges? What are their needs? You know, we need to understand that. And then when we step into their world, we need to be able to address those needs. We need to be able to help them and serve them in those needs. And you know, in the process, we're able to engage, bring the gospel to them, and hopefully they will find their faith in Christ Jesus, okay? Another important thing is this, that uh, when we do the ministry, uh, when we think about the strategies we're gonna use, uh, when we think about uh, methods and means to reach people, very important, we don't want to intentionally offend people, okay? Uh, let's read that, First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31 to 33. Can somebody read that for us, please? Uh, I think it's good to read these scriptures so that uh, we understand uh, what the Bible is saying. So let's go ahead. First Corinthians 10, 31 to 33. Somebody could read that. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also place these all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Mm. So Paul is saying, whatever you do, do it to glorify God. And don't offend people. Verse 32, give no offense. Now, of course, some people will be offended just by the fact that we are bringing the message of Jesus Christ to them. I mean, that you can't help, but 
don't offend people as far as possible. We're not here to, you know, hurt them, hurt their sentiments or any of those things. So give no offense. Verse 32, either the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God. You're not offending Jews, Greeks or God's people. Not, not here to offend anybody. Verse 33, just as I please all men in all things. Very interesting because on the one hand, you'll find that Paul says, I'm not a man pleaser. Galatians 1 and verse 10, I'm not a man pleaser. So true, we are not here to please people. And yet at the same time, verse 33, 1 Corinthians 10 says, verse 33 says, I also please all men in all things. That means uh, he's not, so when he's talking about pleasing people, he's not like doing things just to, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, find favor with them. But it is, look, I'm here to serve them. I'm here to bless their lives in all things. And I'm doing this not for my profit, but for their benefit so that they may be saved, right? So that's, again, a guiding uh, instruction for us that we, you know, in, in, in the strategies we use and the methods we use, don't, Go and offend people. Instead, bless their lives. You, you know, you do good to them so that through that they may come to know Jesus and they may be saved. Okay. And uh, one last thing uh, is in 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 deciding on the strategies and ministries you're going to use. Uh, it's very important that uh, people will find no opportunity to blame the church or blame the ministry. Let's read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, please. We do not want anyone to find fault with our works, so we try not to put obstacles in anyone's way. Instead, in everything we do, we show that we are God's servant by patiently mm. enduring troubles, hardship, and difficulties. Mm, thank you. Notice he says, you know, we don't want to offend anybody so that the ministry should not be blamed. In everything we do, we commend ourselves as ministers of God. You know, in other words, the way we present ourselves, we should be ministers of God. And I'll just quickly uh, share one, one example uh, over here in Bangalore. What happened uh, was... Uh, in, in, in an effort to, and this happened many years ago, uh, in an effort to have an outreach event for college students. Uh, as this was in the middle of our city, Bangalore City. In an effort to have an outreach for college students, uh, there was a fair, uh, and so this was an outreach by a church to reach out to college students. So they organized like a one day, actually a half a day, Saturday afternoon uh, affair. You know, so there was music and all of that. And in order to attract students to come, what was done was um, uh, have this, uh, you know, what, what do we call it? Um, like a lucky draw, you know, so that means you give your name, you you know, you fill up a form and they put it in and then they, they, you know, they do a lucky draw. So the first three people get, prizes and uh, they had very exciting prizes like a, a, a high-end uh, racing bicycle uh, was the first prize uh, again as something like that you know uh, but the whole thing was to attract students to come to that fair that event and it was all done in such a way that uh, you know students would be attracted to come and then when they all landed up there just before the the draw of that, the lucky draw, uh, you know, you preach the gospel to them. Now, I guess the church was very enthusiastic, very uh, zealous and uh, trying to do something very different. But, you know, it really backfired in the sense that people felt uh, in some way violated. Why? They said, okay, this was presented as a fair. This was presented as, you know, some music was happening and some games were happening and there was this lucky draw and, 
there was exciting prices. So, you know, of course, all the young people were attracted to it. And then when they all came there, the gospel was preached to them. And they, of course, they had to wait because only after that they could they would do the lucky draw and the prizes would be given out. But people felt hmm, tricked. They felt tricked into something. And it really left a bad taste. Of course, you know, the prize was given, somebody won, you know, a cycle and somebody won well, whatever the first three prizes was. I don't remember all that. But in that whole, you know, that, that whole quote unquote outreach event, people felt tricked that uh, they were, you know, attracted to it in the name of it being a fair with music and games and prizes and all that. But in the end, the gospel was preached uh, to them, and that was not uh, made known to them. Right. So I'm just giving this example because this actually happened, and to point out that we don't need to do such things where we are, you know, in some way tricking people to come to an event. You know. It should be, you know, if you're going to have gospel music, if you're going to have the preaching of the gospel, state it very clearly, state it very openly. Hey, this is an event where there's going to be gospel music, there's going to be the preaching of the gospel. Come if you're interested, you know. So that way, the ministry will not be blamed. The church cannot, people can't point fingers and say, hey, look, what are they doing? They are, they are you know, in some way, um, uh, uh, you know, tricking people into something. No, everything is clear. Everything is open. People know beforehand what to expect when they come uh, to that event. There is going to be gospel music. There's going to be the preaching of the gospel. There'll be an altar call, whatever. Everything is clear. And then they can make a decision. Do I want to go or not to go? Right? So I, I just give you one example where uh, this whole event, outreach event, was... I mean, there was a lot of money spent and a lot of things done, but the end result was people felt, hey, this was a big trick uh, to preach to us, you know, to get a crowd and preach to us. So uh, uh, we should be careful not to end up doing such things. So the ministry must not be blamed in the, in the, in the, in the strategies we choose, in the methods we choose in reaching out to people in the, in the cities, in the urban crowd. Okay, so uh, let's pause here. We will pick this up again uh, uh, next week. We'll, you know, we'll get into how do you develop strategies? What are some of the strategies we have used here in Bangalore? And, you know, of course, with time, these will evolve, these will change and so on. But I'll just share with you from our own learning and experience so that, uh, you know, you could use whatever is relevant. It might spark some other ideas for you. So um, we will pick this up next week. Uh, before we close, just want to ask any any thoughts, any questions. Uh, yeah, everyone's with me so far. Okay, all right. So we're going to close. We're going to uh, wrap up for to, for today and this week, and then we will pick this up again uh, next week and take it forward. Uh, could somebody please uh, close in prayer? and we will dismiss. Who would like to pray? Thomas, your phone's okay now, or? Okay, but we can't hear you, Thomas. Hmm. All right. Um, Maybe I'll ask, uh, okay, one's not okay. All right, let me just ask Aaron to pray and dismiss us. We will. Sure, Pastor, let me pray. Lord, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to learn once again, Lord, Father. And thank you so much for giving us the spirit of understanding each day. Lord, for, and then Lord, we just want to say thank you again for being with us throughout this month. Lord, I urge and I pray for on behalf of everyone to um, to fulfill a heavenly calling for your kingdom. And Lord, let us not um, 
compromise the calling gives in Thailand that you have placed in, in our life. So Lord, help us all to fix our eyes on you alone. And Lord, we just want to say thank you for hearing our prayer. And I submit this rest of the day into your loving hand. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. Bye now. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.